Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's about time to get started. This is the great debate that you've all come for. I'd like to congratulate you on your stamina for being here on Friday afternoon after everything we've been through this week. Um, but uh, this should be quite an exciting event. We've got uh, four world experts in this business. And the question to be settled is, plate tectonics started in the Paleoarchean or earlier? I had to ask what Paleoarchean actually meant in millions of years. 3.6 to 3.2, I'm told. Um, the um, teams are divided uh, in, well, we have two teams of two people. And we're going to follow a fairly strict kind of uh, procedure, procedural rules for debating, which means that uh, it'll be strictly timed. There'll be a big opportunity for questions after the speakers have uh, given their piece. And uh, I'll say a little bit more about the, the, uh, uh, the procedures uh, in a few minutes. But I'd, I'd also like to just uh, preface this by saying that the speakers have been assigned a case. They have to argue for the statement or against the statement. They may not actually agree with the statement, even though they're arguing for. And they may... Uh, so um, this is something that you have to bear in mind, um, that they won't... You're not allowed to quote them after you leave the room. <laughs> OK, so... The question is, plate tectonics started in the Paleoarchean or earlier? And uh, on the case four, we have Jeroen van Hunen uh, and Nick Arndt. And in the case against, we have Peter K. Wood and Taras Geria. So we have to start somewhere in this question. And I haven't actually consulted very closely with any of the speakers on this question, but I'm assuming that behind everything, we've got some picture like this which has become kind of the accepted story for where the Earth came from after this massive convulsion involving a collision and uh, the resulting mess that it made of everything. And who knows what was actually going on then. Um, I guess uh, eventually it worked its way into plate tectonics that we're all familiar with, uh, as it's shown on the right. Uh, the Earth has a sister planet, of course, uh, Venus on the left, um, that Venus decided it didn't need plates, apparently. Um, and uh, so we don't have plate tectonics there. Somewhere along the line, uh, the Earth decided that it did need plates or it would work better with plates. Uh, and so this is where the question is. When did this happen? What does the geological evidence show? We have uh, uh, a person on each panel who... Uh, is really expert with the geological evidence, who's looked at geochronology and isotope uh, information and the geological record. Uh, that's Peter and, uh, and Nick. Uh, and we have two people who really are experts on the numerical modeling, the quantitative side of things, uh, um, Turon and, and Taras. Uh, and so I think we're going to hear different sides of this question. Okay. To come to the ground rules, um, first of all, we'll hear an opening argument from each side. Seven minutes. Huron's going to lead off. Um, we call him the, the early team. OK, so there, that's the team four. Um, he will be followed uh, by Peter, uh, leading the late team. They get seven minutes each. Then um, the second speaker will have a go, but they're only going to get five minutes, uh, Nick and Taras. After that, we'll, we'll take all kinds of questions and comments from the audience. And uh, I guess we'd like questions to be concise. We don't want five minute presentations from audience members. Um, but uh, feel free to ask them difficult questions. Um, and uh, towards the end, we'll sum up an, a one minute extra for each speaker. And then we'll, uh, we'll make a verdict. And, uh, Maybe we'll uh, do something like a show of hands or uh, some kind of consensus vote to see who's actually won. We're going to finish by three at least. So those last two stages, we'll make sure that they get started by about 10 to 3 if we're, if we're still going that strong. Depending uh, on the strength of the questions and the debate that follows, of course, 
we may not get that far. Okay, um, on that note, have I missed anything, teams? Oh, okay, so uh, Nick thinks we should vote now and then vote again at the end. So that, that's probably a good idea to see, uh, to see who would, uh, uh, how this would actually go. So if I, uh, can I go back here? There's the question. Who would vote on the four team now? Okay, all right, there's a sprinkling of people over here. Doesn't look like a majority. Who would vote on the against team? A little stronger, I think, yeah. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> a little stronger. I think against slightly, slightly has it, that's my perception. But obviously there's a lot of uncommitted people there, and so the teams, I hope, will be wanting to uh, change your mind, especially if you're uncommitted. So, uh, okay, let's make a start with Huron. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks for the invitation. I'm going to make... Uh, uh, okay, sorry. Just to, yeah. I'm going to make the, the case for uh, why I think uh, plate tectonics might have started very early on, paleo or even earlier. But before doing so, let me first point out why uh, perhaps we, we have this question in the first place, why we're having this debate. Uh, Archean was probably hotter by two or three hundred degrees more than today. Um, which has all kinds of effects. It leads to weaker plates, uh, perhaps faster convection. It leads to uh, more melting, which leads to thicker crust, perhaps more, more buoyancy, and again, weaker rocks. So that is actually the main argument why perhaps plate tectonics might not have operated in the early Earth. So this is a popular model that is uh, uh, out there since a, a few years that people argued plate tectonics probably started somewhere in the middle Archean, around three billion years ago. And then before that we had a, a stagnant lid regime, no plates. Afterwards we had plate tectonics. Um, this is kind of supported by a few key uh, papers uh, on this. One is, uh, is this one that, that looked at um, uh, diamond inclusions uh, coming from the mantle, so melt inclusions in diamonds. Uh, and uh, this particular study argued that only those diamonds that uh, um, were or younger than three billion years have actually uh, a melt uh, in inclusion that was um, uh, uh, showing some signs of recycled material that came from the surface. Another argument comes from crust formation that somehow changed around three billion years ago. Um, however, there are several observations that don't really fit that nice and simple model of plate tectonics suddenly starting around three billion years ago. For example, this study uh, by, by Bob Stern uh, a decade ago argued that, um, uh, well, there's several observations of modern style plate tectonics, things like passive margins, ultra high pressure terrains, blue schists, that we find today, and we find them throughout the, the Phanerozoic, but we don't really find them further back in time. Um, if you go to the other extreme, if you go to the oldest rocks on Earth, we find other observations, things like uh, myelinites and terrain accretion, accretion complexes, uh, perhaps even signs of seafloor spreading and, uh, and ophiolites that can be found in those oldest rocks. This is an example of Ishua in, uh, in Greenland, which is almost four billion years old, and we can find these, these structures in, in the rock record. Uh, the geophysical record also has similar signs in the subsurface of the Earth from, from, from geophysical observations. Um, and there's a growing consensus that perhaps cratons, which were formed throughout the Archean, were actually formed by, by, by subduction. And there's a, there's a range of different independent studies that, that support this view. However, there's always the problem that um, there's going to be some skepticism, some criticism about each one of these, of these observations. And uh, um, well, there will always be uh, arguments saying that, well, you can form these observations in another way. And probably a good way of looking at this is, is to, to check whether actually plate tectonics is physically viable. Um, and one way of doing this is through geodynamical modeling. Uh, and this is a study I've been doing myself. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details here, but um, the, the, these, these four different columns here are four different calculations. On the left, we have a present-day uh, cool mantle uh, showing plate tectonics. And then if you go to uh, subsequent hotter uh, columns to the, more to the right, uh, we, 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 we repeat the same exercise in a hotter mantle. 
And to make a long story short, if we look at the first two cooler Earth models, we find plate tectonics kind of operating in a similar way as we know it today. And independent of what kind of starting conditions you use or what kind of material parameters you use, you always get this feature. And this is something that is reasonably well understood, that um, what, what regulates plate tectonics today is, is the mental drag. So it's basically um, the mental resisting plates going faster than they do. And since this is fairly homogeneous uh, 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 mental, so we always have a fairly robust uh, operation of plate tectonics. But if you go to a hotter Earth, this starts to be different. Then the mantle becomes weaker and weaker because it's hotter. It doesn't really limit plate tectonics anymore. And in fact, what is limiting the operation of plate tectonics there is not the mantle, but it's the lithosphere, uh, the, the, the strength of plate, the buoyancy of plates, these kind of things. Uh, and you might find different features, things like frequent slab break or very episodic behavior of, of subduction. But you've also got, if you choose a slightly different model, you might find that plate tectonics normally operated as it does today, or it didn't operate at all. So you've got all kind of different modes of, of subduction occurring when you go to a hotter Earth, something that you don't really find in those, in those cooler models. And, and this is work by the, by the group of, uh, of Taras. Uh, showing also that if you increase mental temperature, then indeed subduction gets a different uh, uh, appearance through time. So how far can we push this back in time? Uh, this is a recent study by, uh, by the group of uh, Dave Berkovici uh, and his former student, uh, Brad Foley. And they use a sophisticated rheology to see how far they can push back uh, the, the, the operation of, of plate tectonics. And they find, actually, using this quite sophisticated rheology, that, um, that you get a more gradual... Rather than having this, this notion of no plates tectonics or plate tectonics, they find uh, a more gradual change. If you go back in time, you find that plate tectonics may have been having very narrow plate boundaries and, and being relatively fast today. And if you go further back in time, the plate boundaries become a little bit more diffuse. Uh, plate tectonics becomes a little bit more episodic. Um, and, um, um, but it still looks like plate tectonics. It still has this, this and this, that's the plot here on the top, it still has this plate-like behavior, which is essential for plate tectonics. So the fact that the, the plates actually have a piecewise constant uh, velocity, even as far back as they claim in the, in the Hadean. So to conclude, um, plate tectonics are... Uh, would like to argue, started in the Paleoarchean, or even earlier. Um, today's plate tectonics is uh, very robust. It is continuous, regular, fairly uniform, uh, whereas the early plate tectonics is much more temperamental, if you like, episodic, uh, perhaps only locally operating, more diffuse boundaries, but clearly having a wide variety. And the final statement I would like to make is that uh, since the temperature of the mantle changed most recently, uh, in the Phanerozoic, I think that's where we can expect the most changes in uh, the, the style of plate tectonics. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now, uh, on the against side, we're going to hear from Peter Kaywood. All right. Um, it's pretty remarkable, isn't it, that uh, we know, we all agree plate tectonics operates today, but uh, you see there the range of um, proposals on when it started. Three, they range over 3.5 billion years. You know, the most dominant process operating on the Earth today, and we can't decide when it started um, and uh, if it was operating uh, being continuously or episodically or uh, whatever. So. Um, I'm going to be arguing uh, for the against side that it started later than the Paleoarchean. And so we know, as, as Greg said, that we had a starting point uh, when it was hot and we have the plate tectonics today. And so the real question is, if you didn't start it early on, um, when did you start it and what came before? And as uh, Jeroen mentioned, three billion years is popular. I'm going to be sticking with that, but uh, I think there is a whole range of possibilities. Of course, if you're going to have a discussion on what plate tectonics is, you probably need some ground rules and agree on the definition. And I like uh, this uh, classic quote, of course, about if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. But of course, there are situations that you only get part of the answer. You might get something that's got a duck bill. It doesn't mean it's a duck. 
all right? And that's really the problem with, with plate tectonics because the rock record is incomplete. We don't have all the information. You'll see we'll all use pretty similar slides, but we're putting different emphasis on the data we do have. And what we do have is something like this in terms of the Archean history. We have a pretty murky view of a duck's foot, if we could even agree that it is a duck's foot. So that's, that's the real problem, I think, and that's why we've got this debate, in fact. And the other point to emphasize about the lack of record is just bear, look at this curve here of Goodwin's percentage of crust, 100% continental crust, zero. We go back to the Paleoarchean, there's practically nothing that we've got to argue with. So it's really a difficult issue. And this is where I think people like Jeroen and Taras with their um, uh, numerical models can provide some insight because they can provide a predictive quality to the arguments. So the question is when, but before we can answer when, we need to know what, why and how. What is plate tectonics? Well, I think we'd agree it's horizontal motion of rigid surface plates about oil or poles. It's in response to the thermal budget. And today, at least, uh, the major drivers for it are slab pull and, to a lesser extent, ridge push. So, well, if we go back in time, what sort of criteria can we see that may be expressions of those types of features? And so, there are things like structural styles that Jeroen's alluded to. Um, Pilbara, prior to 3.2 GA, we had lots of dome and basin type features. Um, but the Yilgarn and younger type Precambrian terrains, we get much more linear uh, belts. So uh, more consistent with modern day type or origins. And indeed, one would argue that those linear origins ultimately resulted in collision and accretion of the stable cratons, certainly in the, in the supercontinent cycle. Thrust faults, um, again, very hard to recognize when there's a limited rock record, but certainly by about, Alan Nutman is shown nicely in Greenland, you get thrust faults that can be traced over hundreds of kilometers um, at about 2.7. People have argued, uh, and different data sets, but perhaps the best one is the Superior, and there seems to be a fossil subduction zone there, which is dated at 2.7. So again, these aren't necessarily for or against, but they're saying that plate tectonics was possibly operating by 2.7. Metamorphic patterns we've seen, particularly the ultra-high pressure rocks, are only present in the young record, and that's one of the arguments for very young type uh, plate tectonics. But there's been some recent papers that have argued that uh, blue schists don't form in high MGO rocks, and that's why we don't see them in older type sequences. Paleomagnetics has been used to argue um, at least for large-scale horizontal motion. So here are... Um, Pairs of continental fragments, Australia and Baltica, at 2.1 and 2.7. And you can see here that their relative positions changes considerably in that time frame, which would again argue for significant horizontal surface motion of those continental blocks. More recently, there's been um, people trawling through the geochemical databases and uh, making compilations. And uh, this recent paper by Tang uh, looked at MGO content and showed that there was a significant decrease in the MGO con content of bulk continental crust between about 3 and 2.5, um, which they argued was a shift to more felsic compositions and also a major change in crustal mass over that time period, uh, and equivalent arguments with different data sets uh, using rubidium strontium suggest similar type time frames in terms of a change at around three, uh, which has also been associated with crustal thickening. And we saw this diagram, Jeroen put it up, on the eclogitic inclusions in diamonds for the subcontinental lithospheric mantle, and they have been argued to represent uh, the effects of subduction and we don't see it in anything older than 3.0. Similarly, oxygen isotopes, a major change at around three, which uh, has been related to increased crustal recycling through plate tectonics. So we're seeing lots of bits and pieces of evidence for changes, and the, the number three is coming up quite a bit in those arguments. Subduction, um, modern day subduction is driven largely by slab pull, 
Uh, and, and as Jeroen pointed out, the early Earth, uh, significantly more rigid, uh, arguments, oh, sorry, significantly more uh, hotter and less rigidity of the lithosphere uh, for the, through the higher temperatures, potentially no subduction or very shallow subduction, so it's very hard to have slab pull in those kind of environments to drive the ongoing movement of the lithosphere. So early tectonics, was the lithosphere rigid? I'm afraid not. Um, so you can see there are significant changes in various features of the Earth record, uh, particularly at around three, all are consistent with that process. Right. All right. Thank you, Peter. I didn't get my laugh. <laughs> OK, we've heard, we've heard the opening arg arguments now. We're going to hear the second uh, talk uh, on behalf of the four team from Nick Arndt, who uh, some of you may know is not just a geochemist, he's also a rock star. He has been seen in the, uh, the performing in the, on, on the stage uh, at previous EGU parties at the end of the performance. Okay, Nick, take it away. Well, thank you for the free publicity for the, for the big party tonight. Uh, my esteemed colleague tr tried to convince you that plate tectonics started very early in Earth history using arguments that I'm sure the more astute members of the audience will realize, will already have realized, are full of nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> He brought up some of the, resuscitated some of those tired old arguments, no ophiolites, no ultra high pressure metamorphism, no blue schists, the domes and basins. Arguments which really don't hold much water because as my colleague explained with remarkable lucidity and clarity, the mantle was hotter in the Archean and the crust was also hotter in the Archean. Most of the features that you showed are consistent with a hotter mantle and crust. The, re the main issue, the main fo issue I'm going to focus on are granites, because granites here in the Archean, like those in younger terrains, quack like a duck. They're the same. They're very similar. And look at this. Formation of granite equals formation of the continental crust which requires subduction, which produces, plate, which is evidence for plate tectonics. These are the arguments. But there are two alt competing theories in the literature, subduction, this nice diagram from Stern, or this strange process called sagduction. Now, how do you make a granite? You start off with basalt. You need some heat and you need lots of water. That's what's required. And how do you do this? In the sagduction model, the lower part of a thick pile of basalt converts to eclogite. It drips down into the mantle, melts, and produces granite. This is the alternative mechanism for producing granite of the continental crusts. But it doesn't work because thick piles of basalt do not have uniform composition throughout. They're differentiated. Every thick pile of basalts, like the modern oceanic crust, is differentiated. And at the base, we find sterile, dry, ultramafic cumulates. The alumina, which is needed to form granite, is here. The water is, only right, is right at the top. So what happens if, for some reason, this thing could destabilize? What moves down into the mantle is sterile, dry, olivine. The stuff that is needed to form granite is here. What we need to form continental crust is subduction. The granite factory, hydrated oceanic crust moved down, it releases water, and it forms continental crust. This is the only credible mechanism for producing the material of the continental crust and evidence of subduction. Now, you didn't bring it up. I thought you would bring up Iceland, which, <laughs> sly dog, you didn't bring it up. <laughs> But what is, Iceland is common, commonly cited as an analogue of Archean continental crust, but it's a pile of basalt with only 10% felsic rock. The felsic rocks are anhydrous. 
the, the mafic mineral is clinopyroxene, even in the rhyolites. It doesn't look anything like, like, like modern granites in its petrology, its lithology, and the trace elements are quite different. The material formed in subduction zones, the basalts, the andesites, and all rocks of the continental crust have these negative niobium, tantalum anomalies, positive lanthanum anomalies, and big positive lead anomalies, a distinctive characteristic of subduction. We don't find it in the Iceland felsics, but we do find it in some of the oldest volcanic rocks we know of in Isua. So this is the basis of my argument. Granites formed through subduction and the oldest rocks contain a clear subduction signature and subduction indicates plate tectonics. Thank you. So the, uh, the first speaker to not use his full allotted minutes but uh, thank you, Nick. And we're going to hear now from Tarasqueria for the second case on uh, uh, against. So I'm a bad guy who has a last word, you know. So, and uh, of course I cannot compete with Nick. He's very convincing and uh, even his voice is convincing. So therefore I will play very, very dirty. So. <laughs> So uh, can you have a, no, no, this is not mine, slightly more, yeah, that's it, you know. So instead of, uh, you know, convincing you with positive arguments, I will just simply try to corrupt previous arguments. And the real fact is the following, you know, we want to reconstruct history of the Earth when we are saying about when plane tectonics started through space and time, so depth versus time. So this is what we want to say, how Earth operated as a whole, not on the surface, as a whole through the history. So where do we have our data in this 2D diagram, depth versus time, along two axes? So our opinion, data-wise, is initially very biased, no matter what you do. Because, and of course, then the next point is that because of the data coverage, the timing of plate tectonics begin is 50% geological and 50% psychological. You know, we look at a chicken, which is the Earth at present day, you know, and we, we have seen it thousand, from thousand different perspectives. So what do we do then if we want to imagine how this chicken was before? Of course, it will be then small chicken or curved chicken or whatever, but when if you did not see a neck, you will never ever imagine that there was a neck. And then you will always propagate and overstretch your chicken back in time. <laughs> this is what you will do, you know. So you have no picture, no nothing, and you have no hope to have this picture unless, you know, you, you, you invent time machine and then travel back, shoot seismic, and, and, and make, you know, photographs of the Earth in the Archean. So you will move this chicken back in time, deform it, just to keep it as a chicken. So this is the, the whole truth about, you know, timing of plate tectonic. So, so in the absence of successful physics-based global paradigm of pre-plate tectonic Earth, we are doomed to overstretch plate tectonic back in time. So this is my first point. So second, before timing plate tectonic begin, we should understand what plate tectonics is not needed for. So, what is it not needed for? For example, you know, let's look at Venus. So, something that I would call plume-lead tectonic regime. So, interaction of the plumes and mental currents with uh, deformable lead, lots of magmatic activity. So, something like an order of magnitude higher uh, plume-lead atmosphere interaction intensity than at present, 600 corona and nova structure. So, but what do we see? Oceanic-like domains with low topography thin crust, continental-like domains with high topography thick crust, motions of cratonic-like terrains, presence of felsic domes, and lots of things that we, we claim this is the only thing that we can produce with plate tectonic. But there is no plate tectonic, so it means that this plume-lead tectonics regime is quite a good regime to make things which are typically attributed to plate tectonics. We can make actually spreading without having subduction on the other side. We can make TTG according to this magmatic thermomechanical model. So then what I'm saying is, you know, what if our 
earth was like Venus and was operating. If we look at this image, cannot we just, you know, do an opposite thing and try to move this type of regime forward in time and see how much we can stretch it? So then subduction is not equal to plate tectonic. I don't have to convince you. There are other plate boundaries. We focus on subduction, but it's not what makes plate tectonic. We, have, we, we do need plate mosaic. So when did plate mosaics and all boundary type has been established? So whether it was, they were established locally or globally and so on, these are all questions that need answer. So subduction is not needed to plate, uh, is not equal to plate tectonics, excellent. And then how and when did mosaic form remain unclear? So I'm really corrupting everything. So and then <laughs> last thing, global overturns which are happening on Venus are as good as subduction and, and continuous plate tectonics. So if you imagine, you know, 40,000 of kilometers are recycled at once, once a billion year, this implies average subduction rate for centimeters per year. So it can work, you know, even from temperature point, it will save our Earth from catastrophe. So it will, of course, promote delamination and vertical tectonic. But so what? So probably it was, you know, first global overturn started, and then subduction only started, you know, less than a billion year ago, as, as, as Bob Stern suggested. So global overturns are good, so let's look at global overturns. Then we have, like, transition. So we have to, to look at the both ends, and this is what I am saying. You know, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, speakers. So... Um, now we get an opportunity for the audience members to contribute, um, to ask questions, to make comments. Um, you can direct your questions at any of the individuals here, or you can direct it at a team, uh, or you can ask uh, even for multiple comments. We, uh, the whole process is being recorded and I think streamed, so it would be good if you speak into a microphone when, uh, when you ask your question. So I open the, open the session to questions and comments, please, from the floor. Mm. Ah, yes, over there. <clears throat> uh, Ina Safunova, Novosibirsk, Russia. So I will not go to the zoo. I propose to stop this and to go to real geology. <clears throat> Recently, on one meeting, there was a George Mooney and the famous Julian Pierce. And Julian Pierce was presenting the Fialite models. And George Mooney asked him, so this means that you can produce ophiolites anywhere? He said, yes. And the, then we do not need plate tectonics, answered he. And then Tim Kasky asked, how would you place in place ophiolites if you do not have plate tectonics? The answer was, I don't care. This is not my problem, <laughs> said <laughs> your physicist. And the second issue. In a re in recent paper, 2015, in Tectonophysics by Camille et al., they present uh, geological data from Naliak Nuliak belt, where they show the assemblage of rocks resembling ophiolites from ultramafix to perhex, then from basaltic top to uh, siliceous rocks like a chart or iron but in formations which could be analogs of modern chart in the oceans. And then again to silicious, and then even to carbonates. So these successions which resemble the successions of modern oceans. Plus they describe duplex structures which are very typical of modern accretionary complexes. What is this then not the evidence for plate tectonics which operated at 3.95? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Is there any, any of the panel members want to respond to that? <laughs> okay, I'll respond, but uh, I would have thought this was a, uh, uh, this should really be addressed by the opposing, t opposing team because I agree entirely. You know, this sort of the observations you made indicate that there was there were sequences that looked somewhat like modern ophiolites in sequences formed 3.9 billion years ago. It seems to be totally reasonable. However, there's one thing that has to be emphasized. Often it is said there's no ophiolites, or few ophiolites, or no convincing ophiolites in the older successions. But we shouldn't expect a slice of Archean oceanic crust to look like modern oceanic crust. The mantle was hotter, the amount of magma that's produced was greater, the crust was much thicker. So if you take a slice, nine kilometers thick through the top of the oceanic, Archean oceanic crust and thrust it onto a continent, 
or you'll get is a bunch of pillow basalts, which is exactly what you see in most Archean greenstone belts. I actually agree with that statement. Um, but what I would say is that uh, if you look at the composition of the crust overall in the Archean, or at least three billion years, it's very mafic. And uh, Nick brought up the question of granites, and yes, there are granites of one form or another. But if you do a compilation of um, SiO2, you don't find that in the modern Earth the mean composition is around 60% or so, it's andesitic. If you do it for the Archean, it's bimodal. There's a, there's a 70% and a 50%, and you don't get the modern type uh, features that you would with uh, subduction zones. And I have, have short arguments. You know, ophiolite means to me presence of the Ashani crust. And it's, then it's automatically translated, if there is an oceanic opening, there is subduction. No. On Venus, we have oceanic-like crust, oceanic-like plates in the absence of subduction. Subduction is, is not must for creating spreading, ultra-slow spreading. It can be, you know, compensated by shortening in some other domains due to the recycling of material into the, um, you know, mantle. And we have examples of such things. So presence of, of oceanic and continental crust by itself does not automatically imply subduction and plate tectonics. Questions? Yes, at the back. Um, maybe the sun uh, sporting uh, to the world during the Archean time, uh, we don't know. And the second, we need to look to planetary observations because we have some... Uh, uh, telescopes, uh, and maybe someone can say about that, similar to uh, Arcan worlds, maybe people knowing already, we don't know. I can, I can in principle respond to that. Yeah. Unfortunately, at present day, we do have lots of extraterrestrial planets, you know, thousands of them, but un unfortunately at present state of, uh, you know, techniques, Accuracy of observation is, is too coarse to see, you know, anything except, you know, uh, some property of the atmosphere in, in, in the hot, uh, hot planets. So we do not have yet resolution. But in the future, of course, this would be a way, you know, to find out if we can Im improve by orders of magnitude observational capacities for extraterrestrial planets. Hopefully we will find another Venus or another Precambrian Earth. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to throw in for the time being that the uh, um, idea that Venus had a con catastrophic overturn recycling is, um, is a little bit outdated. I mean, you know, people working on Venus uh, have more or less you know, transferred to um, thinking that it has been some form of continuous, you know, resurfacing over, with, you know, varying intensity and so forth uh, over the past billion years, and there's even... Uh, uh, yeah, I think Gale in, in England, who believes that uh, Venus has some form of, uh, form of plate tectonics, I guess you would more call it a mobile lid tectonics. Uh, so the, 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 the vision that Venus is as the alternative uh, to, to the Earth, I think, is not what is supported in the way you stated, at least, you know, by modern, um, you know, planetology of Venus, I would say. I think with all these things, we try and build up comparisons, and it's like saying there are only two end members of, our, of mountain belts, you know, the Himalayas and the Andes, or something in terms of modern examples. Each one is unique, each setting is unique, and so I'm sure with Venus, um, you know, it's, it's not a perfect analogy, and uh, I would agree that, that, that catastrophic overturn and stagnant lid isn't the best term, but I think uh, constant resurfacing or, or ongoing resurfacing is probably perfectly applicable. Yeah, and I can only add that uh, Venus does not look like an Earth. It's clear, you know, deformation is not localized in, in, uh, around sharply deformed plate boundary. There is no well-defined mosaic of plates. It bears some similarity, I agree. So there are cratonic domains, there are continental domains, and will felsic rocks are speculated to be present there. But it's certainly an alternative to Earth in terms of, you know, classical definition of plate tectonics. So they are... In this respect, they can be confronted. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to say what, what Peter just said, that 
the two M members of, of just overturns and continuous plate tectonics, I think we can easily expect a whole continuous spectrum. And it's been suggested that these overturns become, over time, less and less catastrophic and more, more frequent, uh, so that it, in the end, uh, just leads to, to slight deviations in, in, in the amount of uh, plate motion, so fast and slow uh, subduction, for example. And I think it's very hard to draw the line somewhere to say, well, these, these overturns are clearly not plate tectonics, whereas the only real plate tectonics is the, the plate tectonics we see today. I think there's, there's a whole range um, uh, in between. And I'll just bat, it, bat in if I could, saying we, we shouldn't stretch the uh, comparison between the Earth and Venus too far. You know, we, you know, there are obvious major differences, the, the, the oceans being the main one, the presence of water. We, our knowledge of, of Venus is, is quite detailed in some respects and totally inadequate in other respects. We know nothing really about the compositions, the characteristics of the rocks. And you know, to some extent, we're comparing the Archean, the early Archean, where we have fragmental knowledge of one type with a planet where we have frag our knowledge is fragmental as well. All right. Questions? Maybe I can just follow up on that and, and ask, um, you know, was the, do, do, do the panel members think that the Earth ever was like Venus? What's the probability that it was? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> only to be argumentative. No, but I suppose, you know, it, it, what do you mean by similar? It's clearly they both, you know, probably started off with a magma ocean that cooled and... Um, then evolved. So the question is, how did they evolve? Um, was plate tectonics ever present on Venus? I suppose would would be a question after it cooled. Uh, so yeah, I think I think we don't know is the answer. We we heard from Taros that many of the things that we recognise on the Earth can be seen on Venus. Yeah, and in general, like the things I was referring to, it, it, it it's not my suggestions. I was just screening through the literature, and this actually uh, a call to Venus is. Uh, repeatedly appearing in the literature, in the recent literature by geologists, geochemists, and so on. They, they do see lots of similarity between this Caroni structure and what they see in Pilbara, and then uh, between this Cratonic terrain in, in Lakshmi Planum and, and what they see in the Archean. So it's not yet a dominant, dominant and popular point of view, but it's certainly a trend. And I can only reiterate, really, it's better to have Venus as a picture for, for Archean Earth than to have nothing. Because otherwise you're always under the risk of exaggerating present-day Earth for uh, influence for the Archean. So it, it should be, you know, we need a balance. Yeah, one, one, I think it's fairly well established that water was present on the Earth's surface already in the, in the Hadean. Um, probably well even before plate tectonics started. And Venus doesn't have any water now. So clearly, I think even the starting conditions for having plate tectonics, we might have to look at a solution that involves liquid water at the surface, which Venus doesn't have. So, so starting with Venus, I'm not so sure if this is the solution. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> uh, and I would vote, just add something. Um, Mars, Mars, is, if you want to look for a, some, some evidence, of, some indication of what the early Earth looked like, Mars is probably better because there was water. Huh? There was water on the surface. Mar Mar Mars is better, it's for sure, because it was only hemispherical magma ocean. It was too cold, too small, so there is not enough driving forces. But what concerns Venus, it looks like for this Venus style of tectonics, if you try to model it, because we have only few, only few, few tools, either observations or experiments and modeling. So what can we do? You can make, you know, Earth or Venus at this hotter temperature in the numerical experiments, and you do not see how much differences because of presence and absence of water for this specific plume lit tectonic regime. So they do not differ much for this specific regime. But of course, if you try to then move Venus to subduction and play tectonics, then of course both planets will, will diverge. So it seems like that for early Earth, the critical thing is huge amount of magma produced within the mantle and then widespread magmatism, widespread juvenile crust production. And this is what was repeatedly indicated generally uh, for, 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 for Archean Earth, that, that this 
And this magmatism changed conditions, actually, and it, and it changed it more than the presence of water. Yeah. Questions? At the back, yeah. Um, I have an idea. Uh, if uh, you have a plastic mass, and if you deform uh, continuously, uh, you can merge a heat. If you uh, if you deform well, it can melt easily. And the the, the orbital uh, distance to the sun about the world maybe is uh, optimum than the Mars. And then uh, the friction. Uh, inside of the uh, Earth is very, uh, uh, I think, uh, in the, the core region, more than the out, outside, close to, uh, I mean, the, the outside is uh, uh, less uh, friction, uh, under effect of less friction forces, but inside, uh, very big, uh, f uh, Supposing to very big uh, friction forces, and at the same time, sun uh, supporting to this system, and then maybe everything starting like that. This idea, maybe. I, I, I guess the point is, is there is some kind of exogenic type uh, influence, which uh, maybe is going to determine this question. I, would I, anybody like to comment on that? Yeah, like in principle, I'm sorry. Uh, in principle. Uh, you know, of course, it's exogenic condition in terms of, you know, heat flux for, uh, at the surface of the planet and so on. They are, they are important, but the biggest player is gravity. So, do it, and, 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 and internal starting temperature. And it's known that for Mars, this is why it preserves so, so, so many of early history signatures. It was, convection was not vigorous enough to reshape surface of the planet. So, there was just not enough energy for this planet. Therefore, it's not a good analogy to Earth. So it's really stagnant lead. And I believe Earth or Venus, they were never stagnant lead. It was this squashy lead or, or plume lead, whatever. But it was deforming because of, of so much uh, magma and, and heat present in, in the interior. Um, yes. Kate Kisevi, University of Oxford. Uh, I had a question for you guys. Um, basically, Taras has just said that uh, subduction and plate tectonics are two different things, which I completely agree with you. But do you consider that there were uh, ways of returning some crustal material back into the mantle in before three giga years? And if yes, could you comment on that or elaborate? Or like on subduction, probably, I don't know. You didn't really mention that in your, uh, in your talks. Thank you. I'll go first. I'm sure Taras will want to respond as well. Absolutely. I think you've got to recycle material. You're producing it. So even in a non-plate tectonic earth, you are both producing crust and you're recycling crust. It's not static. It's a mobile situation. Um, Taras's model of plume lid tectonics is one way of doing it. Uh, and, and a variety. If you have material coming up, you've got to have material going down, basically. Uh, do you call that subduction? I don't think so. It's not continuous. It's not, local, it's not uh, large plates going down at a, at a specific region. You might have sagduction, you know, ec eclogitic drips or whatever, de delamination going on. Uh, I think we don't really know, but uh, certainly you have to recycle crustal material. I just wanted to say, I think it's, it's a good point, you have to bring material down. I think what is also important is that one component that goes down with the downgoing material is some volatiles. You need to bring some water down into the mantle. And I don't think, yes, we might have had some, some recycling of material, but not all recycling mechanisms are able to bring water deep into the mantle. Um, because I think if you do this too slow, for example, uh, you dehydrate the material before it reaches mental depth. So, and I think subduction is, is really a, an excellent mechanism of doing this. And, and yeah, Taras is right. Uh, we might just overstretch it because this is the only, well, only mechanism we know that does this, but until we have found something better, I think it's still a good mechanism. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, that yeah. I just, you know, a few words. Uh, it looks like, you know, in a hot earth, because of this uh, magmatic influx into the crust, you, you, you have always a tendency of uh, creating a hot temperature in the bottom of the crust, which just, you know, uh, uh, decouple crust and mantle. So then, therefore, 
typically, you know, you s instead of subduction and of coherent and resurfacing deep into the mantle, what you are getting are delamination, ecclogetic drips, and lots of uh, uh, crustal convection. And this is, in my, uh, in my opinion, is a mechanism to bring water down. And it looks like at least this model can predict right condition for TTG formation. And it looks like you can build felsic crust by, you know, extracting melts from the mafic magma and then recycling residues. But frankly saying, this plume lead tectonics regime need, need, needs better investigation and comparison with data be, before we can conclusively say what is the mechanism of water recycling and if this is the mechanism. So I've been waiting here very patiently. Um, what is the issue? The issue, we, we seem to have a, a discussion with Taras uh, defending eloquently the results of his numerical models. And in numerical models, clearly we see portions of material that was at the surface, which is dragged down. But this, these mechanisms are not, as, as uh, Hiram said, are not adequate to recycle the materials back into the mantle. We see a lot of evidence of recycle, recycling of sedimentary material, long term, evidence that this recycling of sedimentary, sedimentary material started very early on. We, we see, for example, there's good evidence that the transition zone, which made, is made up of ringwoodite and wadsleyite, which contain water, is probably becoming wetter during time. Water is, bring, is being brought down to the, to the, uh, to the base of the, of the upper mantle, and it's been brought down in large quantities. Now, can this be done by some sort of down-dripping blobs of material? It, it's, it's very difficult to see that this would work, but, uh, whereas we have a very and a mechanism which we understand very well, we can, we can observe it going on today, in which cold slabs of rigid material start moving downwards, bring water part of the way downwards where the water comes off and produces the granites, and a portion of the water continues, continues down. This process is what we call subduction, which is part of plate tectonics. I really don't understand the argument that if that you can have some mechanism in which rigid slab, slabs return to the mantle without, and, and, uh, without saying that this is an essential element of the process we call plate tectonics. Okay. Questions? Yeah, in principle, to, uh, there are experiments which are documented, say, in these ecologic drips, quite high sedimentary content. So there is enough negative buoyancy to bring sediments into the mantle. So they're working as good as, as subduction. So they're not subduction, but they're recycling sediments. No, I, I just have to come back on that. No, the, the, uh, ecle, this, this is a key observation. Eclogite uh, forms by conversion of basalt at high pressures. But it's, uh, unless you have the mechanism of, su of subduction, in which the slab is dragged down for one reason we don't really understand perfectly today, but the slab is dragged down, and once the slab is dragged down far enough, the basaltic component, which is in the upper part of the slab, can convert to eclogite and continue the process. This sort of mechanism doesn't work in downward dripping blobs. We have another question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, maybe a comment. So, uh, subduction and plate tectonics. I think uh, this is just... Uh, um, uh, a question of, of the scale, of, of, of how much. So we do can see, uh, we, we could get something which is going down without, uh, without uh, uh, global plate tectonics. But uh, if we do have global plate tectonics, uh, we have a lot of material which is coming down. And uh, in, in, this, in this respect, uh, I, I want to ask uh, uh, Nick, who is supporting beginning from, from the very beginning. Uh, why then we see uh, ecclogetic diamonds only uh, 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 younger than three point something? Uh, and, 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 this, and this change is very, very sharp. So if you do get something going down, I would expect yeah, a little bit of that in, in uh, 3.9, a little bit of that 3.5, 3 but we have sharp, 
sharp change at around three. Well, well, I was really surprised when I saw the diagram shown by Peter because this is not the diagram that's published in the Nature paper. No, it's not. In the Nature paper, there's just one data point for eclogitic diamond above two point, below 2.7. Uh, we'd have to see the da data again. I'm not, I, well, this, this was the way I saw it. There, was, there seemed to be a change. It's true that in the data published in the paper, there was one clearly eclogitic diamond later than 2.7, but the data are far too sparse. The data that I don't know, maybe Steve, you know, you have, you've seen more data, but from the data I've seen, the argument that there is only eclogitic diamonds after 2.7 is not convincing. Paper, that diagram was taken directly from Sherry and Richardson, the, the diagram I used. Can I uh, just uh, turn this question around a little bit and, and say to either team, um, if, is there any evidence, is there any geological evidence that is just inconsistent with plate tectonics from the uh, early Archean? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you get back to all those points one, one raised, you know, in terms of the eclogitic um, inclusions, the um, change from structural styles, dome and basins are widespread in the early earth, then they change to more linear styles. Um, so it's really, you know, you can make observations about change. It then becomes a question of what's the driver for that change. The four team would say that it's uh, just a, a decreasing thermal regime, but it's all taking place within a um, subduction regime. Uh, we would say that there are, there are changes, whether they are induced by uh, convective overturn, whether they're induced by this in start of plate tectonics, um, we'll leave it up, up to you. It's really, it's a majority decision in the end. We, we are not arguing that plate tectonics in the Archean was identical to modern plate tectonics. That's clear. It's, it's obviously not the case. The, um, the key question, as I, as I said again, is subduction, where, whether there's a mechanism of dragging down water. But all the other features you talked about, the, the changing composition of the continental crust, which does seem to be real, isn't just a, uh, due to the fact that the mantle was hotter, the rate of magma, mafic, mafic magma production was higher, a larger amount of mafic magma would have been trapped within the crust and at the surface of the crust. The dome and basin structure, which you mentioned as well, is largely due to the fact that the fact that the Archean continental crust had a much higher, significantly higher content of heat producing elements and its rheology was different. It really gets back to, doesn't it, what defines plate tectonics? What do you accept as plate tectonics? What are the criteria one uses? Um, and what's your starting point? Is it, is it a chicken or is it an egg? Okay, do we have any further questions or comments? Perhaps I could pose a question, but not only the audience, but for both ourselves, both, both teams, what criteria would you take to change your arguments? In other words, what piece of evidence, if it suddenly became available, would say, no, I'm wrong, it didn't start in the Paleoarchean, or I would say, no, it didn't start at three billion years, or whatever. And I think, you know, we've seen a huge growth in data over the last decade, 15 years or so, Jeroen referred to, you know, the water from the Jack Hills um, zircons, revolutionised our thought about the early earth. Uh, various data sets that have been presented today have changed our, our thoughts. So we're growing all the time. We've got a, a terrible record. Uh, it's that murky, you know, duck's foot buried in the pond. Um, but we're, we're growing all the time. And uh, is there any piece of evidence that would change your mind, Nick or Jeroen? I'm thinking as well. <laughs> but, but maybe maybe one of you has, can start. It, it, it sounds, Peter, like you're not going to change their mind. <laughs> no, I may not. Um, 
and this is the problem, isn't it? We all have a certain perspective. As, as Tara said, it's, it's 50% at least, if not 90% psych psychological. If you're a Mac user, you're going to stay a Mac user kind of thing. Um, I suppose one thing would be to pick up on, the, on Nick's favourite elements or, or, or characteristics, ge geochemistry. If one could establish, um, you know, lots, would, would one take uh, lots of calc alkaline andesites if suddenly someone discovered a whole new terrain that was, you know, 3.8 and, uh, and things? Would that uh, um, convince me? I'm not sure. Uh, but, but I suppose one's got one's to have evidence for t t plate tectonics. It might have been hotter, but you have continuous, ongoing, long-lived subduction zones for a, a, a definition of plate tectonics. To me, um, there's no evidence for any long-lived, uh, downgoing recycling of material through coherent, rigid lithospheric plates. No, but you just mentioned, can we f do, if we were to find a large province of calcalkaline rocks, would that uh, tip the balance? But, but we do. Granites are calcalkaline. They are present through the geological record. But more to the point, um, I've been thinking when you, you ask this question, the real problem is that so many of the arguments that have been used to uh, support the idea of a late start are the absence of, the absence of genuine ophiolites, the absence of high, ultra high pressure and so on. I guess you know, I can easy, easily respond and say if we were to find a lot of uh, 3.8 billion year old ecligitic conclusions in diamonds, this would be very nice, but we know of no diamonds of that age. And isn't that right, Stefan? Yeah. The oldest diamonds, you know, it's, there's a problem there. Um, what are the others? Yeah, Taurus. Yeah, I, can, I can, in principle, answer what would change my mind. So, I would name you essential components of any model uh, 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 which want to deal with their uh, Archean Earth uh, to be able to reproduce kind of essential data available. So, if you put this component into the global model, and these components are, are quite simple. It's uh, magma production from the mantle, magma differentiation, in the crust, uh, positive buoyancy of the mantle because of melt depletion, and then uh, ecologization reactions. So if you put these essential components into a global model, and this global model with you know, reasonable mantle temperature in the vicinity of plus 150 to 150 degree from present, will predict global plate tectonic style, I would be convinced. Okay. Wait. Um, no, wait. Yeah. Do you want to? Oh, no, wait, wait, can I just come back on right. that? No, I, again, I'm thinking. I'm thinking rather slowly, but I'm thinking. Um, one thing that would, would help convince me of the, about the application of the numerical models would be a totally convincing model that reproduces modern plate tectonics with downgoing rigid slabs that behave like the modern ones. I don't think we're there yet. And since we can't, in the numerical models, reproduce modern plate tectonics, this casts some doubts on the other models which are designed to test the conditions in the Archean, which produce downgoing blobs. Yeah, that sounds like a challenge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Nick, thank you very much for saying that. You know, this was exactly our point when we wanted uh, uh, you know, to model Archean Earth. We take most successful model of present-day plate tectonics, which are predicting things that we believe are, are, are observable. And then the idea was we just change mental temperature, and gradually we will get a, a neck out of a chicken. You know, what a disappointment. After two years, all you understand that, you know, if you increase mental temperature, present-day plate tectonic setup are not only useless, they are generally wrong, they are delaying you from understanding anything because all you get is a transient development of destabilizing this stupid plate tectonic setup and then after you know running this for hundreds of millions of years, something that looks like this uh, plume lead tectonics is arising. You know, really, unfortunately, you know, these present day plate tectonic models are not helping us at all 
you know they are, they are, instead they are misleading they are also you know they are limiting your ability to understand what was before we have another question yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> maybe also a kind of comment so what we would expect as a evidence of emerging of plating would be uh, would we expect that it is just leaking in uh, uh, continuously and then we are, we are coming to our uh, present-day plate tectonics, or uh, we would expect uh, to see some big change in something. So I think that we, we should see a big change. And, and uh, the point is that actually, uh, uh, for me, uh, beginning of plate tectonics would be kind of running with barriers. Uh, there are some uh, subduction initiation is difficult. Even, even in, in present-day Earth, uh, people who are doing modeling of that, they know this. Uh, in, in, in Archaea, it would be extremely difficult, as, 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 as Nick uh, pointed out, this, this quite thick crust. And this is very difficult, but when you put it enough deep, it is becoming very dense, and then we are coming to a system which is going on fast. So I would expect a big change. So if you, if you put enough of this very thick crust uh, deep in the mantle, you would get a big change, uh, something not maybe overturned, but something similar to that. So and again, so if we expect big change, what do, you see, what, what do we see as the big changes? Of course, these maximums in, in ages of circles. And at the same time, completely depend, dependent diamonds appearance. Two absolutely independent big changes. What do we need more to say that plate tectonics started at three about? I, I think one of the things we, we, one of the interesting things about subduction or, or plate tectonics is once, once you get it started, it keeps, it, it, it drives itself. It's the slab that drives the plates and because the plates become slabs, they, 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 this is something that keeps on going. But it's not something that would be, a, that would always be robust. Today, it seems to be fairly robust. If you don't, if you don't touch it, it seems to keep on going, and that is because slabs they go down, uh, but they have a limited speed, and actually that speed is pretty good at keeping the whole process very robust. If you go back in time, this probably is, doesn't work anymore. Um, but it still is the fact that once you, once you get it started a little bit, it keeps on going. But you can also interrupt that process more easily, something that we observe today when we have continental collision. Then, then you interrupt the, the, the subduction process and it stops and it doesn't easily start again. Um, so I think you, 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 you don't expect something that really slowly starts, off, starts up. It's something that locally, I, I suspect, locally, uh, the, 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 the conditions are favorable for having a slab going down. This will continue to go down for quite a while uh, until something uh, disturbs the system and it stops again. And then you have to wait for somewhere else to, to, to have it started again. So my, my suspicion is that it actually isn't a global feature to start with. It's something that starts fairly locally uh, and becomes more and more frequent over time, gradually, and that's, this might also explain why you can't really uh, find the, the, the eclogitic diamond inclusions uh, in the early Earth, because actually there were so very few of them to start with that actually, you, 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 well, the chance of finding one, we don't have that many of those diamond inclusions to start with. Um, I think we could easily miss, miss it out. As I understood it, it's just that the first uh, eclogitic diamond inclusion they find happens to be around 3.0. And okay, I, I agree that there's... Yeah, and then the next one maybe 2.8 and then 2.7. But, but I mean, it's, it's not like at 3.0 suddenly they're all eclogitic. 
Well, they almost are. There's a huge number that suddenly come in at three. Um, but I think the, the point, the, the, the question I made about the change is a good one. And I suppose that was my, my point as well. But getting back to subduction, and I also agree it's very difficult to, to initiate subduction. Um, but on the early Earth, I think, indeed, there was material going down, as I said before. There was recycling. But I don't think it was sustained. The plates... Um, broke off. You had constant de detachment. So you didn't have long-lived ongoing subduction zones. They may have been there in terms of an intermittent process, but not as an ongoing continuous process, I think, is part of the, part of the problem from my, from my perspective. With respect to the modern day and collision and terminating of subduction zones, I agree, that's a real problem. And the trouble is we often draw all our diagrams in two dimensions. We draw these cross sections. You have, you know, two continents coming together, you terminate subduction, and you think, oh, my God, I've got to start it somewhere else. Um, I think if you look in three dimensions, I'm not sure subduction is necessarily initiated, whether it escapes out of collision zones around the margins of the, of the uh, amalgamating continents, I think is often more the case when you assemble Gondwana, you assemble Pangaea or whatever, you, you cut out tens of thousands of kilometres of subduction zones, but um, the, the subduction zones then migrated around the periphery of those supercontinents. Can we just uh, you know, the, the the question of whether there was a big a major change a sudden change is interesting, and if you step back a little bit and consider the history of the Earth, the Earth formed there was the major impact, which caused the magma ocean. The magma ocean then probably overturned to produce a thick pile of of mafic material, as on the, uh, you know, to some extent on the Moon on the other planets. The in this context, the Hafnia isotope record from the Jack Hill Zircons is particularly important because that seems to indicate repeated melting of something which was isotopically enriched to low lutetium hafnium ratio without input of, of uh, primary magmas from the mantle. And this is a picture which is very different from everything we see subsequently. From about 4 billion years, 3.8 billion years onwards, we see something that looks very, in terms of its hafnium isotope record, looks just like modern, the modern system. So something, if there was a major change in tectonic style, probably around four billion years. From then on, what happened? The, um, we start to see more and more granite. There's evidence that the volume of the continental crust built up. This was a major, a gradual change that was happening. And if this was superimposed on the temperature record that um, the room for, uh, showed from Coronago and Hertzberg, and, Hawk, and Hertzberg, which shows relatively stable temperatures in, during the time we're talking about, relatively stable but high temperatures from about 3.5-ish to about 2.7-ish. The temperatures in the mantle were remaining stable. The temperatures in the crust on the other hand, were decreasing. So what I, the way I see it is there were changes in the, in the proportions of material at the surface of the Earth, but the changes were gradual and, real, and progressive during that period. I go back to the rock record, which I think is the most important, the lithology, the lithological associations, the isotope data, and we see from the compositions of the earliest rocks, sequences of rocks, which are in all essential aspects very similar to those formed in modern plate tectonic settings. So that, that would be my basic way of looking at the situation. Other questions? I'd, I'd, yes, at the back there. I just have a comment regarding the diamond inclusion record. And uh, I'd have to agree with you guys. The record is very fragmentary and there is no sudden explosion of eclogitic diamond inclusions. These studies are incredibly difficult to do and we have basically very few answers. I do agree we have no earlier than about 2.9 or 3, but what you have to recall, especially when you're talking about diamond inclusions, is you don't only need the eclogitic inclusion, you also need to form the diamond. So you need to have a process to get that material to, to the diamond stability field. And then you have to preserve it. That is, you can't have heating, you can't have uh, oxidizing conditions subsequent to that. So I think what the Shirey and Richardson study actually shows is it, it, it dates the time of when we have um, 
uh, cratons that became where the lithosphere became thick enough and, uh, and persistent enough to hang around. So it's not necessarily dating the onset of plate tectonics as much as I, as I love their work and it's incredibly difficult to do, but I, I don't think it's the onset of plate tectonics that is dated here. Um, look, I agree totally. It is very difficult work to do, and I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, but I, but I would say also that um, getting ages out of that material and ascribing ages to them is also incredibly difficult, and uh, um, not all those materials is necessarily as well constrained in terms of age as one may like. One, one of the questions that I've got is that um, the Tibetan Plateau is an uh, you know, the, one of the major topographic features of the Earth, which I attribute, by and large, to the fact that plate tectonics is operating. On Venus, we have Terra Ishtar. It's quite comparable in its size and its dynamics. And, OK, plate, plate tectonics is not supposed to operate there. Um, should, should we... Uh, how do we take th those two observations and reconcile them in terms of the, the level of stress that's going on and then if we try and relate it to the Precambrian, where you have large expanses of what is lower crust sitting on top of crust, which suggests that there were large plateaus in the, in the Precambrian, is it different? What does it tell us? This is what, 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 what I was trying also to say. You know, like it, it, even if uh, 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 this comparison of Archean Earth with present-day Venus is wrong, it's still very fruitful direction to try to understand how non-plate tectonic planets with lots of observable features is working. So suggestion from people is that these cratonic terrains, they have deep, depleted cratonic roots, and then they are you know, driven by mental drugs and moreover, they, they see strike slip zones around them, indentation zone in front and rifts in the back. So it means that, you know, movement of cratonic terrains through history, not necessarily even only in the moments of, 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 of intense recycling of the oceanic like lithosphere, but also during the you know, continuous history uh, is possible. So this means to me, actually, before we can answer the question, when did plate tectonic started, we should understand what, what was before. And if there is a risk that the Venus was before, it, 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 it needs to be explored. Because once again, these felsic domes, or generally fails the crust suggestions on Venus. Cratonic roots, how hell on earth they, they form on Venus, you know, if, 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 if plate tectonics is not operating there. And lots of other components. So we need more physics and less emotions in our, you know, in our arguments. So. That sounds like a challenge of sorts. <laughs> yeah. Any further comments? I can just jump back to the yeah. comment, uh, the Hertzberg curves on mantle temperature. I think Mantle temperature in the past is unconstrained. I mean, we all agree it was hotter, but I think how much hotter um, is a little bit uncertain. And, and the Hertzberg curve, and some of the, which is basically Yun Karinga's um, modelling-based uh, curve, is uh, based on plate tectonics operating. Uh, and if you don't have plate tectonics, if you have you know, significant overturn, that is going to affect mantle temperature and uh, that probably needs to be thought about and modelled as well. So understanding mantle temperature through time, I think, is an important constraint that isn't as well constrained as we'd like it to be. I would like to say that, that the, the, the data in the Hertzberg paper, I don't think they're... They, they have to make any assumptions about the operation of plate tectonics. I think the curves on, 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 the, on the paper, yes, they assume some op operation of something that's as efficient as plate tectonics in releasing heat, but the data points itself, they're not, I think. Yes, but, um, and, and Nick will, I'm sure, shoot me down fairly shortly here, uh, the, the, the higher temperatures are in large part based on kimberlites, as I remember, aren't they? Okay. Kamadiites. Oh, Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Freudian <laughs> slip. Um, <laughs> Kamadiites. Um, and so I suppose, you know, today we get variation in mantle temperatures, you know, over plumes or whatever. Um, and so how representative are those Kamadiites of the standard mantle temperature at that time? Do we have selective preservation of those sorts of rocks in the rock record? Yeah, no, it's, it is remarkable that the hottest Kamadiite we know formed at 2.7, not at 3.5, and the hottest... There seems to be no 
variation in the maximum temperature of commatiates through that interval. And, but whether this, this doesn't by no means represents ambient mantle, but there should be some sort of relationship between maximum temperatures and ambient temperatures. We don't know what, exactly what that is, though. OK, I'm, I'm going to draw a, start to draw a close to proceedings here now uh, because we're just about out of time. Uh, what we're going to do is ask each of the speakers to just sum up for one minute, uh, make, their, make their pitch to you, and then I'm going to ask uh, the audience for a show of hands about... Uh, uh, who thinks has been the uh, who has won this argument? So um, we'll start off in the same sequence that we led off before. Huron, you have a minute now. Okay, I don't. I don't think I really need a full minute. But what I would like to say is, plate tectonics started early, uh, um, but it started as a completely different. It has a completely different appearance from the plate tectonics we know today. It gradually changed from something uh, that might have been more episodic, more local, to something that's a lot more robust. And I think the major changes in the appearance of plate tectonics didn't happen through the Archean, uh, but they happened very recently uh, in the Phanerozoic. Okay, thank you. That's uh, very economical. Um, P Peter is next. He looks like he's going to get some more slides out here. Up one, up one, that one, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, one minute, Peter. Well, I think this is, this is the basic question, isn't it? What, what do we call plate tectonics in the Paleoarchean, or is there plate tectonics in the Paleoarchean? I never got to this slide, but to, to paraphrase uh, Mr. Spock, if it's plate tectonics, Nick, then I'm, then I'm not sure that, that we know it as it is, as it is today. So, uh, right. Very quick summation, yeah. Nick. To yeah. some extent, you're right. Archean plate tectonics quacked like a platypus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the one thing I thought was very interesting was the, the, uh, the uh, idea that we need better models. A lot of the argument, we have a contra, uh, opposition of two types of arguments, basically. One coming from the numerical models, the others coming from largely from geolo um, geological, ge lithological, structural, geochemical data. And I... <laughs> We, we, we need to continue uh, looking, comparing, looking at the information from both sources to try to get further in this argument. Okay, tell us. Yeah. And I will sum up with the same slide. You know, before we start to care, you know, when we should just answer this red question, because otherwise, we all, even if we suggest some alternatives, you know, and investigate these alternatives. It will be, we will be much in much better situation than we are now, because now we are really here. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd just like to add one comment to this, which is that um, we progress uh, with these kinds of questions by disproving things, not by proving them. And um, on that comment, I'll ask uh, people to uh, vote by a show of hands uh, on the question of... Uh, whether you agree with the, uh, the proposition that plate tectonics started in the Paleoarchean or earlier? Okay, that's a pretty healthy showing. Okay, and those who disagree with the proposition? That's pretty healthy too, I don't know. That's a... I, <laughs> who changed their mind? <laughs> Did any... Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, that seem, seems like a, a fairly equal partitioning of honours here in terms of uh, who won it. I think we can uh, give a big round of uh, applause to our two teams uh, for actually putting the case... And th thank you very much also to all the uh, people who've asked questions and participated in the discussion and, and uh, been in the audience. Thank you. Bye.